when our soul makes the contract to come back in this life, in this way, in this body, part of that contract is I'm going to go through certain suffering. Gabrielle Bernstein, a role model for spiritual seekers. Being a woman, a teacher, a leader, a public figure who has been forthcoming about your experience as a child having experiencing sexual abuse and what it has taken for you to stay steady and, and rooted mm -hmm. in that conversation and, um, and to help others through, through such a common issue, unfortunately, but to help us as, as you have. Well, anyone who's been traumatized, in particular, uh, anybody who's been sexually abused knows what it feels like to keep the secret. You'd think it would be innocuous, and that's what the whole society um, basically believes. It's a lot less trouble to believe that there has never been sexual abuse than to believe a survivor and disrupt everything, rock the boat. So the whole culture and society is sort of um, calibrated to keep the survivor or thriver silent and support perpetrators as just normal. And even if people agree that something's been done just to say, ah, but really is it that big a deal? Mm -hmm. Well, if you've kept a secret, and this is what this book I just wrote is about, you're divided from yourself. So you're presenting a face to the world that doesn't match your insides. You wouldn't think just saying that out loud that it's a big deal. Yep. But in fact, I believe it's the source of all psychological suffering. And the more central the damage is to your your soul, to your sense of self, the more horrible it is to divide what's true in your heart and in your memory from the story people are telling and that you would join in telling. So what happened to me when I decided to be upfront about sexual abuse and it, mine took place in the context of really intense religious uh, insanity. So I came I came out and told that whole story in a book. And what I lost was everything. <laughs> I didn't lose my children. I lost um, my home. I was living in Utah. I was raised Mormon. So I lost my family of origin. I lost my, in terms of them not speaking to me anymore, lost all the friends I'd ever had growing up, lost my job, lost my, left my profession, um, it just ever it came out as gay. I mean, I realized I was gay. I was not a closeted gay person, but I fell in love with a woman. And uh, so there went my marriage and everything went into the fire. And still I felt better, more healed, more whole than I had before. And what I want to tell people is, look, if I can survive that level of loss, I think you can survive whatever happens to you because most people won't have that much backlash mm -hmm. so that's why i told the story to say look this is the worst it gets and it's still worth doing go girl yes <laughs> I, I i really appreciate that i also think that that uh this let's go right into the metaphysical here i think that sometimes when our soul makes the contract to come back in this life in this way in this body mm -hmm. in this time we part of that contract is i'm going to go through certain suffering so that i could live to yeah. tell and be the teacher be the messenger be the coach to, to show people one, yes, here are the practices for recovery and, and, and resilience, but also to, to really be a power of example for people who are living in that. Because I know yeah. for myself, when I, I actually dissociated from the trauma and, sure. um, so talk about, talk about lying, right? Like I, I was like my brain, my brain, my body, everything was lying yeah. for 36 years. Wow. Um, hiding, lying until I remembered. And yeah. in that memory, I remember people, it was women like you th and in the truth of your story and in the, uh, and in the witnessing of your resilience that gave me permission and the freedom to believe that there was light on the other side. And wow. so and they just kind of, let's just go into that kind of metaphysical conversation. I mean, do you believe that you in any way kind of chose this life? Yeah, I do. Yeah. Um, it, I even go a step more because I was so, I felt so separated from the world that I, and so afraid of people yeah. that I never actually identified really strongly with being human. I felt, and I read when I was in my twenties about how trauma in rats permanently alters their brains and they have different 
neural function. And I was like, oh my gosh, I am completely ruined and there's no way back. But then I started thinking maybe it's made my brain different in good ways. Mm. And so, and I think it did. I think powerful disassociation makes you more prone to seek the spiritual, to seek that which is not physically visible. There's a connection with an energetic flow through the world that I don't think we would have had if we hadn't undergone so much trauma that we split from our bodies for a little while totally, and maybe for years. So I actually see it as the soul, not just wanting to help others, but the soul wanting to evolve in its own compassion. I talked to a South American shaman once who said, compassion is the evolution of consciousness in the healing of trauma. Mm. And so to the extent that you've experienced trauma and you heal it, you become more, you, you're able to access much more compassion. And, and sometimes it's, compa- it's the heart as wide as the world sensation. Like you've been completely shattered, then be shattered open. And so not just for other people, but for your soul's own sake, you now have access to so much compassion and the suffering doesn't, doesn't last, but the compassion does. Yeah. Right on. That's, that's, that's so, that's, that's such a beautiful way to look at it. And I also, you know, I study, um, I'm studying uh, parts, parts therapy. I'm studying IFS, oh, internal yeah. family systems. Oh, I'm in that. Oh, yes, you are. <laughs> I got so excited that I got myself an IFS therapist, but I love it. You know, I think that, I think that it's, it, for me personally, I can just say it's been what some of the most transformational trauma recovery of work, really, really all work I've done, work in my, my marriage, work with my team, you know, it's just, it's, mm. it's, it's, it's exceptional. Um, and for people who are like, what is that? We did a, we did an episode with where I interviewed Dick Schwartz so people can go back and listen to IFS right now. But, um, what I w- was going to say about that was that one of the things that I really appreciate so much about that model is that there are no bad parts. And so even right. the part that dissociated in, in my case, in your case, um, you, you know, it, it was really there to protect us from, from, from what we were capable of handling in that moment. Um, for me, 100%. I'm a recovering addict. You know, it's like that the, the addicted part was 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 a protector and it had a really important yeah. role. And so when we yeah. can really see not only uh, the experience of trauma, but also all of the ways that we responded to it with so much compassion, then yeah. we can we can move through it. We can we can become new from it. Uh, yeah. And, you know, I think it's it's interesting. You, know, you, you said something that was really important, which is we have these uh, opportunities when we dissociate to have a, have a deeper seeking and longing for a spiritual connection. And I really appreciate what you said, because I think in some clinical places, it could be seen as like spiritually bypassing, you know, to like mm, just sure. try to get above the pain and the suffering. But I never really thought that to be true. I think that spirituality without the deeper work could be perceived in that way. But when, but, but when there's a spiritual anchor, it is, it is part of the, the guidance to the deeper work because I know for myself, I couldn't have done the deeper work. I couldn't have gone to the places that scared me without that spiritual faith and foundation. It's so fascinating when you go through something and then you just witness the spiritual guidance of, Okay. Yes, you have your therapist. Yes, you have your, um, you know, your your team, whatever it is. But then, you know, these beings, these 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 spiritual beings come to us in many yeah. forms. In some in some cases, physical forms like this. Mm, and yeah. so, I'd love to hear from you just a little bit about what that means to you. What it means to you to have spirit guides, or if you have faith in angels, or let's go there. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, one of the interesting things about IFS or parts therapy is that you just, the the therapist, at least my therapist is so non-invasive. They just say, look at your inner landscape and tell me what you see. And my inner landscape, you know, is just completely populated with wild animals and spirit guides. and, And I don't tightly hold any belief. I think loosely attaching to something and letting it go immediately when it turns out not to feel true or to be destructive that's really the key to navigating the world just don't attach too tightly to anything Mm. except your own sense of truth which is always giving you feedback so one of the things that happens when you decide to come out of denial or come out of hiding and be completely in integrity which just means being one thing whole and intact 
is that you start to encounter the spiritual aspects of your life. And our culture doesn't really entertain that or it entertains it only in very religious ways. Right. But the ways it comes up are like anybody out there, if you close your eyes and you go inward and try to see what the inner landscape of your world is, pretty soon you're gonna start seeing things that are loving and caring and beautiful that never came up in school, but they show up a lot when people go inward, which is not what we're trained to do. So I think the whole world is absolute. I think the universe is conscious. I think everything is conscious. And when we're ready to come out of denial, we meet with a spiritual teacher of some kind. I write about this in my book. Yep. There's when you say I'm ready to go through whatever it takes to be true to myself, to be whole, the universe or in Joseph Campbell's um, typology of the hero saga, the, the spiritual teacher shows up. And it's very often an animal for me. Sometimes it's books. A lot of times it's books. Yep. Uh, sometimes it's a literal person who will just call me on the phone. Happens more and more lately. I was you know, studying Jill Bolte Taylor's work. She's a Harvard neuroanatomist who had this massive stroke. It's the coolest heart. story. It's the coolest story. Yeah, tell oh, the story so just for anyone who hasn't heard it. It's such a fascinating thing. Yeah, well. okay. The first TED talk that ever went viral and watch it and you'll see it. it's fascinating. This is a woman who's like clawed her way up the Harvard ladder to being uh, at the top of her field in neurological anatomy, anatomy of the brain. And at the age of 37, she has a massive left hemisphere stroke, which takes out all her verbal capacity. And obviously a lot of other, leaves her with a lot of other shortcomings. She didn't even recognize her own mother. Um, but it took out the left side of her brain, which is the part that feels fear and the part that controls and talks the right side of the brain feels curiosity rather than fear. And instead of trying to control the world, feels united with the entire universe. She literally felt like she was the size of the universe, this vast intelligence. And it took her eight years to build back her ability to speak. I mean, she's a walking miracle that she can yeah. even function and she's highly functional. But um, she came back to say there's this, the connection with the universe is real. There's nothing... Our, our culture says the left hemisphere is real, the right hemisphere is not. And she says, no, other way around, the, the connection with all things is real. And quantum physics says that, you know, that we're all right. just part of one universal wave function and we're all just energy. And she experienced that. And so now she teaches about it. And as I was like chattering away about it online and whatever, she just called me to say, hey, and other people have called, I'm, I'm working on fear now. One of my favorite experts on fear is a guy named Gavin De Becker. I was writing a text to someone saying I should read his work from 20 years ago when a, an email popped up that said, hi, Martha, sorry to come in out of nowhere. This is Gavin De Becker. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> not out of nowhere yeah. at all. <laughs> so yeah, animals, books, teachers, the very people you're thinking about, the more you are committed to your own truth, the more quickly and magically it seems to happen. When we, I think when, when you're saying the more integrity that we get into, it's also in my language, I might say the more blocks that we release to the presence of that integrity, yeah. the easier yeah. it is for us to establish a greater conscious awareness of all of the guidance that's around us. And so yeah. maybe that guidance is always there, but we don't see it. We're not capable of being able to even witness it. Yeah, I mean, we're capable, but we're socialized out of it. So the, when I say integrity, I just mean being whole and being aware of all the parts of you that are in operation. I don't mean you're bad. What happens is we're all born in integrity. And then as soon, before we can even talk, we confront social pressure not to express ourselves the way we want to. So that people are shushing kids and keeping them quiet and keeping them still. And the kid goes, oh, okay, there's something wrong with the way I am and typically abandons parts of the true self in order to fit in socially. Right. So our society says, no, we can't feel spiritual impulses and things. Those aren't real. Those are woo woo, put them aside. The fact is we do have the capability to do it. The way to come back into integrity is to look at anything that feels bleak, sad, miserable, frustrating, and see what you believe that's at the root of that, that suffering. And just ask yourself, am I sure that's true? So I felt alone, friendless, abandoned in a godless universe where my life, the only thing certain was death and taxes and I hated it all. 
And then I started when I was about 18, I started asking myself, but am I absolutely sure that's the way it is? And I realized that I can't be absolutely sure of anything because everything is filtered through my perceptions and colored by my beliefs. So depending on what I believe, I see a different world. And I don't know which one is real. Mm -hmm. So I just decided to let go of it all and see what happened. And I've been doing that ever since more and more and more. And what happens is these floods of spiritual experience, spiritual companionship, the ever-present love of some invisible, but incredibly tangible conscious force. It's, it's a wildly mystical existence. And we have access to it if we just drop our socialization. In your book, so I want to just make sure I let everybody know the book that we're referencing. It's The Way of Integrity, Finding the Path to Your True Self. I appreciate that subtitle very much. But but yeah. really also just just um, to reiterate that it's, and this is sort of what I love most about this book and about you, is that it's not like we have to go and do something to get something. It's that we're just clearing away to what already is and to the yeah. awareness of what is. And so um, just just let's let's go there. I mean, just giving give, give, share right. anything you want about that. Um, actually, I was standing on the shoulders of a giant. I, I decided to base, base this book for some reason on Dante's Divine Comedy. <laughs> and it wasn't until I was three quarters of the way through that I thought, why am I doing this? <laughs> but it, it, it works. Dante was a genius and he actually was a genius at telling us how to wake up spiritually and, and psychologically out of suffering. So I start, the first part is, Dante called it the dark wood of error. So his epic poem starts in the middle of my life. I came to myself in a dark wood and I didn't even remember how I got there. Mm. I was terrified. I was miserable and I didn't know the way out. So he's just wandering around going, what do I do? And all these people are climbing this mountain that looks all exciting. And he, I think that's a metaphor for trying to succeed in the world. But, and he tries to climb it, but he can't. And it's all very scary and exhausting. And then he says, okay, I, I need to get out. I'm willing to do anything. And boom, he meets a spiritual teacher. In his case, it's the poet Virgil. And I'm sure Dante, the real person, since he lived many years after Virgil, just encountered Virgil's writing, but he took that as a spiritual teaching. Yep. And what Virgil does is take him into hell. He, and that's Dante's famous Inferno. And what he does is he goes through hell and he goes deeper and deeper. It's a big pit in the ground and it's conical. And he goes down and down and the suffering of the demons on each level gets worse and worse. But here's the crazy thing that people don't know about Dante's Inferno. They could leave. In fact, there are regular delegations of angels that come down and say, anybody want out of here? And mm. they don't leave because they're attached to what they think. They're attached to visions of revenge or victimization or whatever. And he just questions them and he goes down and because he doesn't attach to anything, he's free to move through it. And that's like the process of therapy. You know, you just go deeper and deeper. You face the demons that believe I'm no good. I deserve to be punished. Whatever the lies are in your head, you go through hell to disbelieve them. So yeah, this is the entire book in like five minutes. So cool. he gets to the bottom. And this is what really captivated me about the divine comedy, even when I was a teenager. They get to the very bottom and it's the monster Lucifer locked in a lake of ice. So hell is not full of fire. Well, there's fire around, but the deepest part of hell is being frozen away from joy, frozen out of activity. To me, that's depression. That's where I was throughout my adolescence and young adult years. And Dante says to Virgil, we can't go any further. We're at the bottom, we're at the center of the earth. And Virgil says, no, you have to keep going down. And he's like, what? There is no more down. And Virgil says, no, you have to. So he climbs onto this monster's body and he lowers himself and he finds a little gap right about the hip level where when he goes down, he has to turn around and he's still climbing the same direction. But because he's past the center of the earth, what was down becomes up. Mm. And if you go deep enough into your own hell, while you're going the same direction, down becomes up. And then, then it's like three lines until he's out of the whole thing. And he says, yep. walks up this path and he says, we came forth and once again, we held the stars. And that's how therapy works too. If you like this video and you want to get more Gabby, check out the next one right over here.